Welcome to Exploring the Mystical Side of Life. Hi, this is Linda Lang from ThoughtChange.com, and I'm here today on Exploring the Mystical Side of Life with John Heaney, author, humorist, and spiritual mechanic. We're going to learn a lot today about John's unique perspective on how to work with energy for co-creation. Welcome, John. Thanks for having me. It absolutely is delightful to have you, John. Now, you call yourself a spiritual mechanic. What do you mean by that? From all walks of life, asking me about basically perspective and my take on things and principles seemed to work out pretty wonderfully. And they started asking me, what do you call what you do? And I didn't, I just called it common sense, really. I, that's all I thought I was sharing. But they really wanted something more pithy and more. So I just thought, well, actually, I think I'll call it spiritual mechanics because that uh, causes people to think it's relatively unfamiliar. And it means a lot because basically what I was doing is looking at humans and how hard we are on ourselves and on uh, each other. And we're just so tough on ourselves as a culture. And really, all of life is physical and spiritual. You're, the body you even inhabit is made up of chemical processes and things working together. And everything we see around us from highways and buildings and homes are created from nothing. They come from spirit. And you mix in a little bit of focus, intention, dreaming, creativity, you bring things together and you create something. So both the esoteric and the physical are working all the time. So it is definitely a co-creation process. It's a, it's a wholesome, fulsome mix that's always flowing in and out of itself. So there's no separation. So to call somebody spiritual is a bit dumb <laughs> because they're already of spirit and they're already vibrating and they're already in it. Exactly, exactly. And do you have a really interesting story, John? Why don't you tell us how you develop this perspective and this way of working with energy? Well, one facet of my life in professionalism and education was communication. So I got into journalism and I got into reporting and then I got into high tech and then I got into publishing. So I was in communication. Personally and health wise, I was born about a pound or so living uh, in the Montreal General for my first year in an incubator. And I always joke with people and say, what do you do in an incubator for a year? You just plan your life. But, but the joke is you get to watch humans before you depart. <laughs> the average baby just pops out and has to get started. I had observation skills <laughs> that I, I was able to hone, right? So I did emerge with some slight neurological anomalies that made sure that I didn't become an NHL hockey star. But they didn't slow me down. Uh, and I continued to have fun, and I saw the world in a slightly different way, and I continued to have all kinds of adventures. And uh, when I was 35, in the shower one morning, a shock went through my brain and right down my spine, and I crumpled to the floor, and I lost my fine motor skills, my ability to form my words, uh, and much more. Uh, so getting myself to the hospital and then years and years of going through the system, diagnosis and so forth, they finally said, well, you have a form of cerebral palsy, something else called ataxia, something else called aphasia, something that's a movement disorder people don't know very much about called dystonia and Tourette's. Uh, and I was having about 60 full body convulsions a day. So I kind of had to leave the medical profession. I rolled into the alternative. I went through uh, that forest and I came out the other side saying even people in that camp are being too problematic, too fearful, uh, too issues based, too problem based, and nobody's having fun and nobody's forming a team and you're wearing out the patient. So then I said, 
I've got to put my own team together. It's never been done before. I don't see anybody around me doing it. I don't have any roadmap, but I know what it's like to be there. And I said, there are people all over the world in wheelchairs and other circumstances. I know them, they are my brothers and sisters. What if I got something together to show how this could be done for them? And to be clear, when you talk about team, you're not specifically meaning a team of doctors and nurses and medical practitioners or alternative practitioners. No, no. because if you make a declaration, it kind of came out of me almost as something that's become very uh, central to my sharing, which is the phrase, ladies and gentlemen. And in emotion, if not verbally, I was sending out a signal, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all people who have my five conditions, watch what happens as life comes together to build a team to show how this works. Now you're working with energy and my short form for what you can't see, I just use the term atmosphere, right? So the atmosphere contains uh, spirit, angels, intention, dreaming, uh, feelings, all that esoteric stuff you can't sense easily. And you're just calling that in too. Life turns around, you become more fascinating and more interesting. And answers start flowing to you. So people from all over the world, in a very complex story, started getting in touch with me. Each of them had a piece of the puzzle but I was doing something else. I was becoming a mentor and a teacher, and I was teaching practitioners how to do things. And it is essentially you know, kind of putting out something to the universe and waiting for the response to come back to you. In a way, but also one of the bigger pieces about spiritual mechanics is humans have a great deal of difficulty uh, settling themselves in this conundrum of who are we? How could we be of spirit and are we divine and this and that? So we become seekers and, and go on long journeys and go through processes and, and rituals. And I just looked at that and said, heck, <laughs> come on, why don't we just enjoy the ride and I am of a spirit, I'm already divine, I'm an aspect of the divine. So there are 8 billion aspects of the divine through humanity walking around right now, right? I'm just a point of view and an aspect, but I'm no less divine than you are. Let's move off the table all this struggle and get right down to as long as I'm divine, I might as well have a good time. And so what I noticed was that the atmosphere, you see humans believe and believe and we believe there are seven days a week, right? We believe that there are all kinds of things we just agree upon. When humans agree upon something that affects the atmosphere and the atmosphere becomes habituated and the atmosphere says, oh, the energy in Ottawa is going to change because it's Monday morning. It's okay. really a figment of our imagination that yes. manifests. Yeah, exactly. And so the atmosphere reflects what we believe. And when you stand up in your, hu your humanity, and what I call your bold humility, and say, I've never done this before with these five physical conditions, but I'm bold enough to know that I can make a difference. So here goes. The first thing you encounter, which is rather astonishing and fun, is the atmosphere has to get used to that. Because the atmosphere is seeing a human being stand up and say, let's do this differently. So then it really does become a co-creation effort. Yes. So all that energy gets to play differently and the energy loves you so much for doing that, then the energy starts to say, let's have more of this. Well, what I love about what you're saying, John, you're alluding to the fact that the energy has consciousness, which of course 
We know, <laughs> but nobody treats it like it has consciousness. They treat it like it's just a tool mm -hmm. that they can use. So I think that's actually brilliant the way you work with it. Well, you're talking about creation. Uh, old ways is how do I put the people together and convince the people and get the money and get the team and the men and the workers and everything to finish something and get something done. Uh, so you're outcome based. But when you become uh, a spiritual mechanic, you say, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all projects around the world, Watch what happens as I apply my project to show how energy functions. So then energy comes around your project, fascinated by the concept, and everything goes smoothly because you're demonstrating something. So you've just given us an example of one of your declaration statements. Yes. You always start, ladies and gentlemen, why not? Why not? <laughs> because I say it's only three words and it says a hundred things at once. It's it is very inviting. It's inclusive. It's inviting. It brings curiosity. It's an announcement. It's about something's going to happen. And it says, I don't care what energy is in my presence. I will treat you with respect, regardless of who you are, until you prove otherwise. So that, as I say, that includes any dimension of energy you would like to include. So John, do you also then state on behalf of all the people? Mm -hmm. Well, as an exercise, it, it, has, it has three parts to it. There's the ladies and gentlemen, which is the announcement. Then the interesting thing is you're moving into service now instead of being isolated. Okay. So if you're suffering from stage fright and that becomes an isolated performance, how do I avoid stage fright? What's my ritual? What do I eat beforehand? How do I stop doing it? How do I prevent myself from going into it? And you're insular and you're inward. Okay, but when you say, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all people who have stage fright, which is a very, very common conundrum for people to be in, right? So it's almost universally understood. So then your energy is going into service for all your brothers and sisters around the world who suffer from this. Okay? You're moving into your divine creativity and you have to finish the sentence. As I say, once you get into this, you don't even have to say ladies and gentlemen anymore because then the atmosphere, you know, Linda Lang raises her finger and the atmosphere goes, oh, it's Linda, here we go. <laughs> and away we go. And it starts. And yeah. it starts. Because you have a reputation of using it. Fantastic. So John, you have these, declarations that you make to yeah. the universe, to spirit, to all the beings anywhere yes. have any kind of consciousness that might be able to contribute or benefit. Mm -hmm. Very inclusive. And this is what you use to overcome your health issues. Ah, you see, we're moving again. This is spiritual mechanics. Door number one is overcome. Door number two is demonstrate. We set ourselves up as our culture. I jokingly say that 98% of our issues are cultural, they're not personal, right? Uh, even the subtlety of overcome, which tightens the speaker, tightens the uh, receiver of the statement, tightens their body, okay? Tightens the circumstance, and we're off again, right? I agree. So, so, so th this is why I do what I do in spiritual mechanics, because I, I also say that I only have one client, and it's our culture. So to be clearer, 
to be very clear, this type of declaration made to the universe mm -hmm. is how you demonstrated health instead of what the medical mm -hmm. community was forecasting for you. And beyond health, becoming not so insular and inward about how do I, to how do we, to watch us, to bring delight to uh, practitioners too. Because many practitioners of the medical or, or alternative camps are stuck in things because the atmosphere is stuck. And I started talking about this phenomenon I use a lot. I talk about people's crowds. And this comes from my journalism background, recognizing I had astonishing adventures because I recognize when a mortal walks into the room, they're far more than the physical person I can see. They have history and adventures and networks and they know people and they know people who know people. And so if we personified everybody's background and we said, okay, Linda Lang has family, neighbors, relatives, deceased relatives, angels, former relationships, high school buddies, grade school teachers, <laughs> okay? And we piled all that behind you and we saw all those people, that's your crowd. And everybody's traveling with a crowd. A big crowd. A big crowd. So I started playing crowd to crowd and I went, I went from, you know, that's kind of an interesting principle and imagination and I turned it from imagination to a reality and I started working with people's crowds. And it has quite a sense of adventure to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an interesting gang of mortals who are readers and they, they're able to see and they can read my aura and they can tell me how I'm doing and whatever, but by using their skills, they're learning. So this, this whole thing continues to be a very service oriented teaching experience. And when I work with, let's say young people who are very, very attuned with energy, they love meeting an old fogey like me because they get to, gee, this is, this old guy's having fun with energy and I'm 14 and uh, if he can have fun with energy, I can have fun with energy. <laughs> and and so it, it goes like that. So the atmosphere gains and then you gain and it goes back and forth and back and forth and it creates traffic and flow. So I would say that the sky is the limit to how you could use spiritual mechanics. Yes. And so I have stories from all over the world where people... You know, uh, a woman came to see me once from Iceland and she went back to Iceland and she emailed me from Reykjavik and she said, my friends are astonished. I've completely changed. They don't know what's happened to me. And, you know, how does this work? I tell people on travels, when you say, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all people taking a train ride or a plane ride, on behalf of all people stuck in airports, <laughs> right? and your aura changes. I was stuck at Heathrow Airport for five hours one time. And so you're sitting there and the old you is, I'm getting bored and frustrated and tired. And the new you is, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna work with people's crowds in the, in the airport. And, and you have a great deal of, of fun and, and time flies, no That's pun intended. Awesome. Can you share any kind of miracle stories with us? Well, I do have one about a friend who had a daughter who was an opera singer and uh, she knew me and she knew of me. And so she uh, called me up and she said, I have my, my first actual professional engagement as a solo singer for an entire evening performance. And I can't do it and my knees are knocking and I'm nauseous and I'm... The old school says you get to the issue and you protect yourself and you prepare, which is too much work. And I said, do you know the power of music? And do you feel what happens when you sing? And I said, so spiritual mechanics would say that the music and sound, the creativity coming off of you has an energy so rather than 
preventing stage fright, let's use the evening to make the world a better place and say, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all opera singers, watch what happens as I use my voice this evening to heal the crowd. And so your music will waft across the audience. You won't have to do anything because life knows exactly what each person in the audience needs. And you will be in service, right? So you expand, like you're expansive and you're breathing and you're thinking of others instead of yourself. So she had the performance and she called me up and she said, it was just groundbreakingly astonishing. And I blew myself away and I got a long standing ovation and they wanted encores. But afterwards, people from the audience came to the stage and came backstage in tears and they started telling me about feelings they were having during the performance and how this had stopped and that had stopped and a, uh, a widow came up to me and said, I've been grieving my husband for eight years and he came in the middle of the performance and that's all gone now. So, um, she really thought that was marvelous. And then within a week or two, I got a call from a friend of hers in New York City saying, I'm giving my first performance at Carnegie Hall and I hear you help people with stage fright. <laughs> and so that's how my work travels. You know, it's a, it's a wonderful mix of creativity and demonstration and subconsciously you are honoring your presence your influence, your imprint, your impact, and your divinity. Well, you are definitely a word wizard. Definitely. Could you create a spiritual mechanic statement that we can share with all of the listeners today? Here we go. This is marvelous because now you're honoring what you're doing. So you and I are sitting here in conversation in the now in, in one term, but as this is replayed and listened to, that's another kind of a now. So loving myself and wanting to have some fun, it's ladies and gentlemen, you've been watching and listening to Linda and I conversing. This has been absolutely fantastic. Notice how the pulse and the broadcast of this conversation goes out and out and out and touches the crowd around every listener. So their crowds relax, bringing joy and relaxation to listeners and people in spirit tell other people to tell other people to bring mortals to have some more fun. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. John is an author. I've got one of his, was this your first book, Thunder Within? Yes, and I have, if you can see it, I have the new edition here. But I also, people ask me to write some more. So I have my second book, which is called Ladies and Gentlemen, Daring to Live What the Soul Already Knows. And you can go to my website at www.johnheaney.ca. Well, I'll make sure to put that link in the show notes. And I hope lots of people go and check you out because it's a really, really fun way of working with spirit, co-creating, putting out intentions, and just allowing magic to happen. That's it. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Exploring the Mystical Side of Life. Please check out some of our other episodes and subscribe to the channel. You can reach me at thoughtchange.com or on Facebook as Thought Change. Bye for now.